You ready to get started? Yeah. Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA, my name is Fanny Wolfowitz and I am an educator at the museum. Today, you will have the honor and privilege of listening to Sally Frischberg, a Holocaust survivor from Uziowice, Poland, who also happens to be my grandmother, share her story with you. After she's shared her story, uh, you can, you'll have the opportunity to ask her any questions that you'd like to, and you can do that in the Q&A feature on the Zoom or uh, if you're watching on Facebook in the comments. Before we begin, I would like to share a few words about the museum. Holocaust Museum LA was founded in 1961 by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure that the world would always remember and learn from this tragic history. At that time, the Holocaust was a very recent memory and many survivors were not yet ready to relive and share their experiences. Thanks to the courage and foresight of this small group of survivors, they established what became the first survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States, guided by the mission to commemorate educate and inspire future generations. We st still carry on the mission of our founders on a daily basis by offering free Holocaust education to students throughout California and the greater United States. Today, it is my honor to introduce my grandmother, Sally Frischberg. I have been fortunate enough to hear my grandmother's story countless times, beginning at a young age. Learning about her experience has undoubtedly shaped me as a person and inspired me to work at the museum today. So without further ado, my nani, Sally Frischberg. Take it away. Hello, everybody. I am happy to be here. And as I understand it, my job is to tell you what happened to me during the time of the Holocaust. So I'll do that in as brief a form as possible, because I think we are limited to 40 minutes or some such thing. And I mean to finish the story within that time. I was born in Poland in 1934. You know that that is five years before World War II started, which is the Hitler War upon the world. And our invasion uh, was very, very fast. One, two, three, we fell because Poland was no match for Germany and therefore could not fight it and succeed. And therefore we were a fallen country very quickly. And uh, we arrived at our home upon finishing the parade of invaders. And when we arrived, we discovered that our home was going to be occupied by Germans because they had no room in my little town where to be uh, housed. And therefore an officer was there to introduce himself very properly and to tell us that because of the nature of our small town and because their army had too many soldiers there, and no space in town, they were going to occupy, occupy space in the homes of private citizens. And we were one of those homes. And after this very brief but concise introduction to their coming to live with us, uh, he left and three officers arrived. And we were quite shaken up by this, uh, but nevertheless kept our composure. And I am amazed to have to admit to you that this was the best thing that happened to us during the war. Because one of those three officers a man by the name of Herr Mr. Arnold, a former teacher in Munich, Germany, was an officer who was an occupant with other two. The other two kept their distance from us. They were always correct 
and um, well-mannered in their behavior, but they kept their distance, while Mr. Arnold became very friendly. And a great part for that was due to the, his love of playing chess and seeing that my father was a fit opponent. So the two men sat and played chess all the time. And when they could, they talked and they could talk a lot because the other two soldiers were away from home most of the time. They were in headquarters. The biggest house in town is now headquarters and the soldiers who sleep on benches and wherever they can find space come to spend the time there. And our soldiers who sleep in our home spend the time there too in the company of their friends where they play chess and cards and whatever they do because they're not fighting now. They are resting. They have been successful. They took Poland and they're resting and waiting for further orders. My father and Mr. Arnold play chess and talk all the time because Mr. Arnold speaks German naturally. My father speaks Yiddish naturally because in Poland, Yiddish was the natural house language for Jews. And the two of them discussed the war situation and they discussed the history of it and they discussed history far, far before it happened. And they're constantly playing, thinking, telling each other something and continuing the game. It was an endless game whenever my father was home. And as a result, we were privileged to learn the truth about what was, what was happening to our community because Mr. Arnold told my father quite honestly that the Jewish community was doomed to die. He said, in other wars, the soldiers on the field died. Those participating in the battles died. But here, the dead will be the most innocent, the oldest, the youngest, the sick, and the Jews. He said, the Jews are doomed to die. And with that kind of warning, he began to add hints of my father's need to not trust what he hears, but to act on what he sees and to find a way out of this situation. Do something. If you don't protect your family, they're dead and so are you. And this was a constant refrain in every conversation. And my father listened but could do nothing during war, every opportunity is cut off. You can't act. And uh, my father had no, no means of changing that impossible situation. But we hung on until Mr. Arnold moved out. When Hitler declared war about, uh, upon his former buddy, Joseph Stalin, so that he could take over Russia. Uh, Mr. Arnold went, was invited to battle. They sent him to fight and win that possibility. And he left 
And my father had all these warnings in his consciousness, but no means of doing anything. Nevertheless, he kept struggling. I, can't, I don't know what he did because I was, what, a child of four going on five. I don't, I have no idea what was going on. But we, we struggled without Mr. Arnold, whom we missed immensely because he was our protection from the dreadfully anti-Semitic Polish community who were very eager for us to be killed fast. The job should be done and it should be over. Well, what are we to do? We didn't know and we struggled on. And then the, the, the dilemma was solved for us. A sign came out on the church which said that all Jews must come to the railroad station, station and they gave us a time and date in the f near future when we must appear for resettlement in the east of Poland. And when we made inquiries, why are we being re resettled? We're happy here. We don't want to be resettled. We were told not to be fools, not to protest, to behave well, because they're doing us a great favor. They're settling us in the East. Never mind that Auschwitz was in the East. What they were telling us is that in the East, we'd have better jobs, better homes, better health care, better schools, everything, everything would be better. Well, my father remembered Mr. Arnold with great affection. And he said, Mr. Arnold told me not to believe the liars. This is a lie and I will not believe it. We must do something else. We will not go on the railroad. And the night of before resettlement in the morning, we packed up whatever we could. My parents then had four little children. We had had five, but the youngest twin had died. So we were four little children. And I must have been by now almost six because this happened in 42. So we were all packed up at night I had a little pack to carry and we left our home, but we had nowhere to go, no place. No one would help us. By now, every Polish citizen that was not Jewish knew that if he tried to help a Jew, he too would die. And if his family was involved, his family too would die. Now I ask you, would anyone help if that was the punishment? At any rate, we left and we headed for the fields. Poland is a little country with plentiful fields. So we went in the fields. It was early summer. And the fields were full of huge, what we, we call uh, heaps. And these heaps were, uh, they were made, of course, they contained all that was harvested and built into heaps waiting on the field to be taken away to make finally bread or whatever out of it. And we approach these piles of grain and we made a hole by pulling out the inside of the heap. And we got in there and we hid all day. 
my mother and father and their four, four children. And next to us was my mother's brother, his wife, and their three children. These two families decided that they didn't stand a chance and they didn't want to impose upon younger, freer relatives. So they chose to go on their own, but together, so they had each other. And uh, we were hiding on the fields and every night we moved from one pile to another field. We did not want to be discovered. So we did, we did not leave a track behind us. And we kept moving from field to field to field to field again and again and again. And it was getting less comfortable because of the weather. It was beginning to rain, to be chilly, to be very uncomfortable. But we kept doing it, nevertheless hiding during the day inside the heap and getting out at night and walking and picking whatever we could by way of nourishment and finding a new field. We didn't know what we were finding. My father may have known. My father was remarkable when it came to geography and he may have known something about each field but the rest of us knew absolutely nothing. And this went on for a period of time. And the only change continued to be the deterioration, the rapid deterioration of the weather. And we worried very much that we couldn't continue this and that we would have to give up. And one night we heard what I call the, a magic whistle. We heard a whistle that was familiar to my mother and her brother. And when they heard it, they became electrified by it. That's our whistle. That's our whistle. Meaning that when they were youngsters and they played with other youngsters, their Catholic friends in Poland, everyone is Catholic except the Jews who were not. The kids, all of the kids knew that sound. And they, when they heard it and wanted to be part of the group that was playing, they just followed the sound of the whistle. And my mother and uncle recognized it. And they said, is that a friend trying to warn us? Or is it an enemy trying to betray us? They had no idea, but they took a chance and whistled back. And the magic man showed up. Stanislav Rucholsky, a friend of their early childhood with whom they spent a great deal of time as children because he was an orphan child his parents having died, and he often was in my grandparents' home. And my grandparents, my grandparents had an absentee interest in his lack of parents. And they saw to it that Stanislav and his only sister, who stayed with him in the little house, that the parents left. The other children were taken by aunts and uncles to be saved. But Stanislav and his sister Kasia were in the house under the supervision of my grandparents, growing up to be healthy, strong, having gone to school and to church. They were, they had a, a mostly normal life. And Stanislav, after he hugged and kissed my mother uncle, and uncle said to them, 
You can't do this. They know where you are. They are looking for you. They will find you because they know you. They know your direction. They will surely get you any day. We must do something. And we didn't have what to do. We had no options, nothing. He came back the next night, the next night. He turned our directions because he knew they, where they were looking. And so he revealed it to my family and my family chose to go in the direction he sent us and we were surviving but we were having a great deal of hardship due to the terrible change in weather. And eventually we knew snow was coming and this won't work anymore. And my mother said to him, Stashek, you must do something. You must build us a place where we can hide. And he said, I haven't got a board or a nail. Everything was taken away. I have nothing. How am I going to build? So that was not an answer. So everybody was thinking feverishly, what can we do? What can we do? And he thought of it. One night he arrived. He lined us up single file. And he said, you must follow me in total silence, not a sound. You must hold hands very tight so that you don't lose a hand in the dark and have to call for, where are you? You can't do that. You must be totally silent and follow me. And my father was at the end so that we don't lose the chain. And we followed him and we walked and walked and walked. We had no idea where he was taking us. And finally, he brought us to his home, a modest farmhouse where when he, we got there, he said, you must be shh, quiet and you must go up to the attic. And in the attic, he had arranged hay on the entire outline of the attic. That was our sitting or lying down space. And we were forbidden to make a sound or a move, except to the uh, buckets that he lined up in the middle for us to use as toilets. And this was our new home. Although we hoped that it would be a short time, it turned out to take two years before we were liberated from that <coughs> attic where we had very little to eat, but he did, did feed us. Every night, very late, when his whole family was asleep, we heard the ladder move back to the open space and he would come up the steps and take down the, uh, the buckets of filth to clean and bring up again for the next day. And then after he had that in her order, he brought a bucket of boiled beans and potatoes. And that was our diet, which we shared very, very carefully two pieces of potato, 10 beans, that was the diet. And this continued until one night, he said to my mother, you have four brothers that are still alive. And my mother said, I do, where are they? They're in the forest, in the forest. My God, they'll never survive. They'll freeze to death. Starshek, you must save them. And Starshek said, I can't. I'm afraid. If we are found walking, we can walk by day, that's for sure. But at night, 
somebody will give us away and we will be found and we will be killed. And then they'll find out about my wife and children and you and we're all dead. No, too great a risk. We can't do that. And my mother begged and begged and begged and after a short time Stashuk said look he said do you want to kill us all and she said Stashuk you don't understand God will protect you you will be protecting his children and God will protect you and Stashuk believed and he delivered my uncles one night. They were half frozen, that's true, but they were alive and they defrosted from the warmth from the rest of us. And Stashik saved, well, out of the uh, uh, 11 and five is 16 and three died. The first loss was my baby sister, Fagy, who was the older of the twins that were born when the war started. And Fagy managed to, to stay alive. I don't know if it was a year or two years, but certainly it was no more. <clears throat> she managed to stay alive. And then she showed signs of death. It was very clear to all of us that she wasn't going to make it. So my mother and father came upon a, an insane idea. They wrapped Faggy up and they put her in a little uh, car, not car, a little basket. And they covered her up and they put her at night on the doorstep of the priest in our town. <laughs> These towns are all near each other. So we were never far away from our town. And when the priest found the baby in the, in the, in the basket, he knew what it was. And as my parents expected, he knew and he knew what to do. He persuaded a young woman in town that he has a child that needs care and would she cooperate and help him. And they made up a story that this child was related to the young woman who was going to take care of her, that her, these, the mothers were sisters and the other sister was very sick and this one was supposed to take care of my sister and she did she tried but it was too late Faggy died in her care after Faggy, a little cousin david who should have survived it was a strong little guy, I don't know how old, my guess is about four, and he didn't make it, he died. I Certain things I don't know because in our family nobody talks about this. My parents didn't, my aunts and uncles didn't, nobody talked about it. And so I never heard anything. Either so I saw it or I don't know it. I saw him die. And after him, his mother, a woman that I remember very well, as very strong, very kind, very patient, very eager to explain to me what the difference was between me, my sisters, and her son, because I didn't have a brother. I didn't know why he was different. She explained it to me very, very wisely. And I remember the explanation very well, but she died too. 
So we lost three in the attic. And the other uh, oh, 12 that survived, the others were liberated by the Russians in 1944. We returned home at night after Mr. Grocholsky warned us that we must never, never reveal his name or tell us so at what happened here. We all swore that we wouldn't and no one ever did. I'm the one who opened her big mouth because I too was committed to silence and not telling anything. But another miracle happened and I changed my way. And when I changed my way, I, I had to reveal his name because I want the world to know these saints, these people who saved other people, even though we didn't share the same religion. And my gratitude is such that I believe they, their memory will help keep the future going. That if we don't acknowledge what happened and why it happened, and now history tells us why it happened, we can learn everything now, it's an open book. For a long time, it was a secret. And we who survived kept it a secret. We thought it was the best thing for us. But the truth is that the best thing we can do is teach our young people to participate in the running of the world, to stand shoulder to shoulder with other human beings and to prevent such hideous behavior from ever happening again. And that's my story. And if you have questions, I don't know, but you're welcome to ask them. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nani. Um, hopefully we will have some questions come in, but that was wonderful. And I love hearing your story. We can read some of the comments. Robert Ryan said, you were my Holocaust high school teacher at Fort Hamilton High School. It was a great pleasure. And I graduated in 1992. I don't know if you know. No, and Fort Hamilton High School is where I taught. Oh my goodness. A, a pupil of mine is writing yeah. that. Oh my. Robert Ryan. I don't remember Robert. I'm sorry, I wish I did. I remember some people and some people write to me. And those who write to me tell me that they are thankful for what I taught them because I have turned their lives around in a better direction. And that makes me very happy. We have one question. Somebody asked, what did your father do for a living? My father was what I call a dairy broker. He bought cows. He housed them in the stables of the richest man in our town. And he paid for that privilege. But he took the milk and he had it converted to cheese and butter and, and sour cream and whatnot. I don't know what else. And uh, the, the difference between paying and what was left, the what was left part was our income and that's what we lived on. And we were comfortable. Somebody else would like to know, um, I'm wondering if you've ever visited your hometown. Yes. Yes, I did visit. I never could visit while my parents were alive. They were very afraid of Poland, very afraid. You see, after we returned, our townspeople were wonderful to us. They were helpful. They were eager to, to, to promote our improvement 
bodily. And we did improve. We normalized. But the rest of the country didn't see it that way. And the unfriendly people uh, organized and three of them came to my home. Everything works in threes. Uh, they came to my home at night with guns and they announced that your Jews, we don't want any Jews in Poland. Go back where you came from you Christ-killing Jews. If you stay here, we will come back and kill you. Well, we did not need much more warning. Now we believe very easily that, that, that those who threaten do kill, they do. They do it today too. And so we left Poland uh, illegally. We, we uh, went through from border to border without papers or any regard for anything. We went as far away from Poland as we could. And until we found the American zone, thank God for America. May America live forever. Uh, some people would like to know how you ended up in, in America and if you were in any DP camps. Uh, we landed up in America because once we got into the American zone, Americans were very interested in stabilizing us because we were roaming all through the world. Not just Jews, by the way, were roaming. Others, too, who, who found life as it had been unlivable. And so here we were in these camps, displaced persons camps. There were no children, by the way, because the Jewish children were all killed. And so I never had friends until I finally did reach America. But anyway, uh, the Americans wanted stabilization, and so they tried to help us and they tried to figure out what was best for us. And they said to my parents, well, well, where would you like to live? And my parents said, doesn't matter. It's okay, wherever we are, we're, we're happy here, it's okay. And they said, no, you can't be here because you are not living, you're existing at, in, at the, mer the mercy of others keeps you alive. You need to be able to do this yourself. And you can, not as, as displaced persons. So would you like to go to, uh, they would name some wonderful places and we didn't know them and we didn't care to learn. Certainly not we children. At this point, I am by the way, 12 years old. And I, I never heard of all these countries. And so, uh, Eventually, they say to my parents, where do you come from? What country? And my mother and father say Poland. And they say, would you like to go back to Poland? And my parents said, never. I would never, never go back to Poland, no matter what the circumstances. With such anger. And the uh, conversation continues and they say, well, is there any place in the world that you'd like to go to? And my father said, I have two brothers in America. If I could see them again, I would die a happy man. And they said, in America, you have brothers in America? And my father says, yes, but I don't know where they are. They said, don't worry, we'll find them. And they found them very quickly. And they got my uncle, one uncle, to send papers. The other one was in Germany, sending out messages over radios to attract our attention. But we had no radio. We didn't know he was calling for us. At any rate, because of the goodness of President Truman, we were, we were early... Uh, immigrants, and we arrived in America in 1947. 
And from then on, things were good and better and better and they're wonderful. And I would never live anywhere else in the world except Brooklyn, New York in America. Um, someone else would like to know, how was your family able to find food in the big heaps of grain? And what kind of trauma did you suffer from you know, from your experience? The food was not found in the heaps of grain. The food was found by creeping out. And, and also while we were walking, picking fruit, and we became survivors of fruit. And uh, had it lasted longer, we might not have made it, but that ended soon. And we, we, as you can see, I made it very well. Uh, now, uh, then second part. Oh, the second part was what trauma did you experience? This, the most serious trauma that I experienced, what, experienced was when I learned secretly, someone told my father, a neighbor who followed my grandfather you see my grandfather never would never run away from home he was a, be a believer in the german extraordinary story of excellence the germans were very talented and hard working and produced marvelous things. And my grandfather was a reader who marveled at all this and admired it immensely. And he said, people like this don't do harm to other people. These are the people we depend on to improve lives conditions. And you want to run away from them, he said to my father. And he would never run. He would not run. And my father had an, one more brother. And my uncle Naftali was the youngest of the brothers to whom, and he lived with grandpa. And my father said to my uncle Naftali, Naftali, you are young, you are bright, you are strong, you are able you know the, the, the feeling of the land, the touch of the land. You know what's where here. You can survive and you must survive because the future depends upon people like you who will manage to survive and warn the world about the harm human beings can do to the to others who are less able to protect themselves and the rest of the world you must survive it's of absolute necessity and my uncle naftali was surviving but they found him and they shot him they murdered him that was it So my, my greatest trauma are probably the loss of my grandfather and my uncle. And in the case of my grandfather, a neighbor was sharing with my father that when my grandfather went to the station, they took him to a community not far from our home where they had gathered Jews from other communities. And once they had them there, they gave them shovels and had them dig. And once they dug, they shot them into those, those holes that they dug. And then they covered it up with soil. And then people noticed for days after that the soil was moving. And I got it into my head that my grandfather died while alive uh, and I had nightmares in the beginning I had nightmares that I was being buried alive and that was not fun 
But as I became more secure and learned that I shall overcome, all I have to do is struggle. I put my effort into the struggle and I had less nightmares and they finally went away and I won. So someone else would like to know, what made you so strong to never lose hope? I think that hope is something we can create. If we try hard together with others, we will improve the situation, whatever the situation. And once improvement starts, we can improve and improve. So the knowledge that hope comes from what we accomplish. This is the source of our home, of our hope. If we accomplish, then it will work. And that means I must do something. I dare not sit and wallow in, in regret and sadness and fear. No, I can't do that because I'm giving up my hope. And no, I won't do that. I will not give up hope. I look forward to my children and my grandchildren having a better world. Somebody else would like to know, um, was your savior installed in the Yad Vashem Righteous Among Nations? Yes. When I came to terms with the fact that silence was not an answer, and that I must speak up. I uh, went to Yad Vashem and I told them my story. And they looked at me, I, this was many years ago. And they said to me, how old are you? And at that time I must have been, I don't know, 20, 21. And I told them the truth. And they said, how old were you during the war? And I told them the truth. When it started, I was four. When we, was, we were resettled, I was six. When we were hidden, I went from eight to 10. I gave them, and they said, you don't know anything. You were a kid throughout the whole thing. And I said, I remember everything. Try me. And they refused to try me. And I kept coming back year after year. I was back. And I, I know they said to each other, oh, no, here she comes again. But it didn't stop me. I kept coming back. And then one day I was asked to speak at an army camp in New Jersey. And I spoke. And during the speech, uh, a lady stood up and she said, sitting next to the man uh, that she sat, she said, now, do you believe me that we need to do something about these people? And he said, yes, yes, I do. I believe you. We'll do something. And he gets up and he says to me, young lady, would you please not leave without seeing me for a minute? I need to talk to you. I said, oh, yes, I'll wait for you. And I waited. And by now I was married. So my husband waited with me. And we, when it was all over, he came to my table because we were having lunch after the session. And he said to me, I need to speak to you privately about your past. And I said, be glad to speak to you. And uh, we went off into a corner and he said, I can help you with your problem with Yad Vashem. Would you come to see me in my office? I said, sure. Where is your office? He was an invited teacher at Yeshiva University in Manhattan. And my husband and I showed up in his office and he uh, sat down next to his uh, typewriter and he said, tell me your story. And I told him the story as I had told the museum. And he just 
cut out little parts. And the little parts had to do with the fact that my mother's jewelry and her fur coat and the money my parents had went to Mr. Grucholsky. But They weren't a bribe. The, this was the money that was used to support in the best way that they could all of us who were up in the attic. This was the purpose of it. But when I told it to Yad Vashem, I didn't clarify this. I didn't think that part was important. I, he knew that they cut me out because Yad Vashem will not accept anyone who can be suspected of having been bought, of having been bribed. But this was not a bribe. We didn't buy the man. We helped him feed us. And he put it in those words. And now, in no time at all, I got a paper from Yad Vashem that Mr. Graholsky was being honored in Yad Vashem. And after that, we had had a huge party in Poland, which the party was uh, financed by Israel because Israel lost its, its majority of citizenships. They were killed before they got there. Uh, America, because I'm American. Poland, because it happened in Poland. So these three countries financed this big party. It was really a huge affair. It was huge, I remember, because when we were asked to stand up to, on, to honor the person that was being elevated in Yad Vashem, when it came Mr. Graholsky's turn, 27 people in my, in my entire family stood up. No one had that many representatives. So uh, I remember that distinctly. And... Uh, I, 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 it's a happy memory. I'm glad that he's being honored and I think it's necessary. It's necessary that young people know that there are good people in the world. There are, there are very few, unfortunately. But young people should know that they're there because in some way we depend upon them. Without Mr. Graholsky, I couldn't struggle. And now I'm, I continue my struggle in every way I know how. And here I am. Was there a specific event or moment when you decided to tell your story? Yes, the, it came upon me slowly. I didn't decide uh, rapidly, oh, I'll tell it. But slowly, little by little. Actually, I have a good man to thank for that. When I, I became a school teacher and I was teaching at Fort Hamilton High School in Brooklyn and where that first speaker writer uh, uh, met me and the English chairman found out from some intimate friend of mine that I was a survivor and he always came down to lunch during my lunch period and he sat next to me and he always asked me questions. He asked me this, that and the other thing and so on. And then one day he said to me, you know, if I had a person with your sensitivity, I would create a program of Holocaust studies. I would make it available to English or uh, social studies students, and they could claim the credit for whatever they wanted. It would be a, a special subject that they could elect 
I, and then claim the credit either in the literature department or in the uh, social studies department. And he said, I bet we would have a good deal of interest. Unfortunately, he said, I haven't got a soul I can give this to. And I said, well, you'd be making a mistake with me. And he said, why? And I said, because to tell you the truth, I never wanted to learn a thing about this. I wanted to keep as far away from it as possible. And so I don't know anything. You don't want a teacher who doesn't know anything. And he said to me, well, but you're very young. And if you wanted to, you could learn. It's never too late to learn. And I took this as a challenge. And that summer I went to school. And after that, I took night classes at Brooklyn College. And after that, I came back to him about a year or two or three later. I don't remember how long. And I said, do you remember? And I reminded him of what he said. And I said, OK, I'm ready. He said, you learned? I said, yes. I took and I showed him all the courses I had. By the way, I, I got a very good arrangement in Brooklyn College so that I didn't have to do the sort of work that other learners were doing because I had told the person who was registering me that I was a young mother of a hardworking husband and that I couldn't give it time to write term papers and to study for finals and so on. And she arranged it that, so that I had a special right to sit and listen. And what happened as a result was the responsibility of my chairman. If that satisfied him, they were he could use whatever he wanted. But uh, without their help, without their goodness and understanding, I don't know that I could have done it. But I did. I learned and I came back and I taught. And at first it was very hard to do. And there were times when I broke out in class and wept. And the kids would run to the to my chairman and complain that I was, well, I don't know that they complained. They just said, Mrs. Rishper cried in class. And he said to them, you leave her alone. She came this far, she'll go on. Don't bother. And we went on and on and on. And I taught the course for 20 years. And when I left, it continued with a pupil of mine who had been in the class. But I don't know what happened since I've been gone out of there for more than 30 years. So I don't know. Um, someone would like to know, how was the transition to life in Brooklyn? And did your whole family come here together? Yes, my whole family came together. The transition was difficult. It was especially difficult for my mother. My mother was deeply hurt by the loss of two children and by what, what transpired. She never learned English properly. She, uh, she had a difficult time, but the rest of us made it, my father, learned English very well, went into business, was, was functioning very well. And we, we three sisters were doing very well until things change, comes an age when things change and it's more difficult. Um, someone else would like to know, how did your faith remain or change over your years in hiding? My faith is what it probably would have been 
had I not lived through what I did. I am one who, I don't know of anything about God, except that I have arguments with God often. I'm not pleased with the way the world is run. But I, I, I am not making any kind of religious decisions. I was born a Jew because God wanted it that way. I will remain a Jew until death. And what happens after, I don't know. <clears throat> I, uh, I leave it alone. I, leave, uh, I, I have faith in the future. I have great hope. But I am expecting activity from the young, the youth, as opposed to God. If you just sit on your chair and wait for God to solve every problem, forget it, you're in trouble. Well, on that note, what is your dream for the future of our youth in America? My dream is for a world that cooperates. Otherwise, they'll never overcome the problems we face. And if the if the human beings cooperate, then they will create heaven on earth. And I would love to see that, but I won't. I may see it from another platform. I don't know. But uh, I have faith. Yes, I have faith. I think a lot of good can be done, but you must want to do it and then put your your faith and your strength into it. And how many children and grandchildren do you have? I have only two children, but I told my daughter once, I don't miss the children I never had. I didn't have more children because I wanted to do what, what I was doing. I wanted to, to teach and I taught and I'm very happy that I did. And uh, uh, there was one more part. How many grandchildren do you have? And my grandchildren. Ah, they're the joy of my life. I have four grandchildren. And uh, I couldn't live without them. I need all four of them, or four of them all the time. I couldn't live without you. Um, all right. Well, I think that's our, that's our program for today. So. Thank you so much, Nani, for sharing your story with everyone who's listening. And thank you to everybody for participating and asking questions. Um, for more information on our museum and events and programs in the future, you can visit our website at holocaustmuseumla.org. And otherwise, I wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you. Yes, I do too. Bye-bye. Bye. Well done. <laughs>